Hi, and welcome back to another episode of The Talk, brought to you by Time Out UAE Kids. I'm Kelly Johnston. This week, our episode is brought to you by Water Wipes. They're very natural baby wipes that are made from 99.9% high purity water, plus a drop of fruit extract. Water wipes have been specifically developed to be as mild and pure as cotton wool and water to help maintain the important skin barrier function while offering the convenience of a wipe. Water wipes provide safe cleansing for the most delicate newborn skin and are so gentle they can also be used on premature babies. They're recommended by midwives and other healthcare professionals worldwide and have become the preferred wipe for many neonatal intensive care units. Furthermore, they are accredited by Allergy UK very apt sponsor this week because we are talking to two experts on baby care. When you've done your nine months of pregnancy, you're really excited for the big moment, you bring your baby home, but now what? Let's find out by talking to our experts. Welcome back to another episode of The Talk. We've got two fantastic uh, health experts here with us today who are focused on babies and toddlers. We've got Louise Cremonesini, who is um, a pediatric nurse and health visitor, and Marlin Gavami, who is um, a midwife and nurse, and both of them are at Nightingale Health Services. Thank you, ladies, so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you for having us. So I think we'll we'll start right at the beginning. Seems like a good place to start. So we've done. We've got ladies out there who've done their nine months and they're waiting for that, you know, exciting moment. They've got their new, they've done the birth, they've got their newborn baby in their, in their arms, they're in the hospital and they're told that they can go home <laughs> tomorrow. And that part is actually, I think when things start to get a little bit scary, they don't come with a manual, obviously. So Marlin, what, what sort of reassurance can you give to these ladies um, when they first take their baby home? Okay. So first of all, before leaving the hospital, I would say take the opportunity and utilize the professionals that are actually working in the hospitals. Because in Dubai, we have amazing midwives and nurses working, very much experienced with breastfeeding support and skin to skin, how to give a baby bath, how to change that diaper, how to to look after the cord. These sort of things that you might be, that might be a bit scary in the beginning, especially with the first baby. So I would say before you go home, make sure that you ask all the questions you have to the staff in the hospital. And then the next step would be when you're coming home, um, I know by experience from myself and from all my, all of my patients, it feels super, super overwhelming only to open up that door and you might feel a little bit, oh my God, what should I do now? So take it in to start with, take a couple of deep breaths and give it perhaps maybe a couple of days. Don't start, uh, you know, searching on Google the first couple of hours. (laughs) Uh, Enjoy the time, get to know your baby. And then after settling in kind of a little bit, after the first couple of days, if you feel like you really need someone to come home and teach you things, or perhaps have a good look on that breastfeeding, see if it's going well, or if there's anything that needs to be corrected, absolutely take the support that we have in Dubai. Again, outside the hospitals, we have amazing midwives, we have uh, lactation consultants, doctors, everything you need really. So for sure, just to know that we have help to offer in Dubai can can really give you a good start. Yeah. So if you if a, a, a new mummy were to say to you, I'd like you to come and, and help me, I'm sort of drowning or I'm I'm not sure how to do this, I'm I'm struggling with breastfeeding. Um, how often would you go and see them? Um, and how long would you stay with them? Yeah, okay. So as a normal schedule, I usually go out and see them on day four. Um, if they are, I mean, day four after delivery, meaning the age of four days for the baby. Yeah. Yeah. Because we know that it takes a couple of days before the, the actual milk comes into the breast, sort of saying. So usually the, the breast, breastfeeding related problems kicks in on day three to four. So that's a good time for me to step in and sort of try to solve the, the possible problems that they might have. After that, I usually try to come out and see them again on day seven. And then after 10 days, 
And after the first three sessions, we make an assessment to see if I feel like I need to come back sooner, let's say in the next couple of days again, or if everything is working now, if I feel like I can kind of, you know, push them out and try their wings a little bit, usually I would go back then in a couple of weeks, maybe 14 to 21 days. Because as much as I feel like it's good to have that kind of routinely support, at some point you really need to let go of your patients and uh, same thing for, for the mom and the father and even the baby. They also need to, to, to try and solve problems by themselves, if, if that makes any sense. Yes, and exactly. Of course, if the family might feel like, no, 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 I can't do this. I need Molly to come back tomorrow or maybe sometimes even the same day. Of course, I will do that. It's all in um, an open discussion together with the family. And you mentioned, um, we're talking about things like, breastfeeding and um, diaper changing, things that I think that people will have read books and they know, they know to expect that. But one thing you mentioned that I personally remember feeling quite terrified by with the first baby was this, the, um, when they take the belly button, you've got the belly button, the stem, what the, the, where it's connected obviously to the center and having to clean that and look at, and then it, for it to drop off, I found that terrifying. So, yeah. <laughs> so I think it would be lovely to talk about that and talk about how you keep it clean and what parents should ex new parents should expect with that because i found it quite oh. <laughs> yeah absolutely and it's very common to start I, I have to say that because if you don't have any healthcare background whatsoever i mean obviously this is very scary it's a piece of flesh basically coming out from your baby's tummy so i understand that that might be a bit scary so i usually say you don't really have to do that much except for keep it clean and keep it dry and at the same time, whenever I say that, they might think, so how do I keep it clean? But if you, if you maintain um, the baby's skin, meaning every day you have a good look, undress the baby, which is really important. So you, so you have a good look overview on the baby from top to toe, two times a day. And if you see that the cord is getting drier and drier, which means it's, it's decreasing in size and it's changing in, in color as well. At this point, it might start to smell as well, but that's okay. It doesn't mean that you have to super, super clean it only because of the smell. It's just, um, it's very normal. It's, it, it's in the process. So as long as you're folding the diaper down a little bit and you expose this little thing to air so just to 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 let it dry out faster and if you see that it's coming a lot of discharge uh, some yellow gooey out from it you can use uh, cotton pads like the one we clean our ears with and the best thing to use if you want to clean is really normal saline and you can find this easily in the pharmacy you can even make it yourself if you want to to google normal saline recipes it's basically it's really only salt and water it's a salt and watery solution and um, it's very nice it helps to heal wounds and to clean the skin and everything else really so don't use any strong soaps or especially not alcohol alcoholic solutions because if it comes to that then you might have to call a healthcare professional to come out and clean it sort of in, in an antiseptic way. And it drops off after how long? Seven to 10 days. Okay. Um, and I think as well that a lot of people when they bring their new baby home think they're not gonna sleep ever again. But actually, I seem to remember, it, it may not be at the same time as us, but babies do sleep quite a lot in the first few weeks. So. Louise, you were, you, I know you um, practice some sort of safety of swaddling babies and keeping them you know, safe while they're asleep. So could you just give, um, give some of our, our viewers uh, an idea of how they can safely put their babies to sleep? Yeah, of course. So newborn babies tend to sleep approximately 14 to 16 hours of the day. But obviously all infants are different. So you might have some babies that sleep for longer. And the time that they will sleep will also depend on the method of feeding. So we mm. tend to see that breastfed babies will wake more, and that's purely down to the consistency of the milk. So if you compare a, a bottle of breast milk 
towards a bottle of formula, they're very clearly different in their thickness. And what we know is that formula fed babies sleep for longer because of the complex fatty acids in that milk. Um, and, you know, obviously we want to promote that breastfeeding is best, um, but what comes with that is potentially a baby that waits a little bit more. So in terms of safe sleeping, in order to reduce the risk of sudden infant death syndrome, we would say that all infants must be placed to sleep on their back with their feet to the bottom. Really important to ensure that their temperature is constant and you're looking at a temperature of about 20 degrees, 21 degrees. Now obviously in Dubai, I, I, certainly in older villas, the AC is a little bit temperamental and sometimes it will say that your villa is, I don't know, 23 degrees, when actually it does feel quite a lot cooler. So if you can have an independent temperature control, one of the temperature eggs or another little device that records the temperature in the nursery, that's a really good way to go to get a true sense of temperature. So when, with the temperature of 20 degrees, what sort of things should they be wearing to sleep in? So you would have potentially a vest and a baby grow, and then it would depend on whether your infant was swaddled or not. If they're not swaddled, then they might be um, just with a blanket or your parents might have a grow bag. So there's all sorts of range of products now that are on the market for sleeping with. But important that in terms of safe sleeping guidelines, I would advocate what we would call a naked cot. So this is a cot without bumpers, without fancy lace, without anything that potentially creates a hazard for that newborn baby. Um, but obviously lots of people will choose to swaddle. Some babies really like swaddling. And again, if you're going to swaddle, that's absolutely fine, but swaddle with arms up so that your infant can then make themselves cooler if they begin to overheat. If you swaddle infants with arms like this, like a soldier, it's really difficult for them to get any cool air in. Um, but again, we must emphasize the need to place the baby on the back. And often, you know, we might have infants who are colicky or who have reflux. And, you know, certainly Marlin and I come across infants who've been advised to sleep on their fronts or sleep on their side. But categorically, in terms of safe sleeping, we advocate sleeping on the back. And that's really the, the you know, over the past 20 years, we've reduced the, around, the amount of um, sudden infant death substantially. Um, by that health promotion message. That's super important. Um, and what about with, you mentioned formula feeding and breastfeeding. Um, with formula feeding, there is more of a tendency possibly to expect a routine, whereas with breastfeeding, I think the expectation maybe is that you are going to be doing the cluster feeding. But I, I formula fed my first one and then breastfed my second two. And the first one I did manage to get into a routine, whereas the second two, it was very much feeding on demand. Now, I don't know, uh, probably, I don't know which one was right. And I think that people are very much looking for an answer and maybe there isn't one. Um, but what, what do you advise when it comes to routines? Are they just a big no-no and you kind of need to go with the baby's needs or? I, th I mean, I think probably Marlin would like to add some bits to this, but I'll just say my view. Um, I think routine is, is good, but you know we can read lots of the books that talk about a more rigid routine but the issue with that is that your infant hasn't read the book you know and infants are by nature spontaneous beings and often do not fit well with a rigid um, didactic sort of routine so I think whichever way you feed your infant it's good to get into a routine of regular feeding slots and with a newborn baby you're looking at feeding every two to three hours um, and obviously if you have a formula fed baby that might go slightly longer but certainly even at night time we're looking at infants that wake sorry we should be waking them up to feed them then yes when they're little because and it it, there's lots of different factors that you're looking at. You're looking at the weight of the infant to begin with, and obviously the smaller that infant at birth, the more they will wake because they have a smaller tummy. Um, and 
for a bigger baby, they will sleep for longer because they're able to take on more milk on board, fill the tummy, sleep for longer. But I think um, it's important before that baby even comes home from hospital that we're that we're realistic about our expectations, so that you know it's really normal for an infant to wake in the night, really until they're six months of age. And often, you know, I do a lot of sleep training, but I don't start that sleep training until 26 weeks. Um, so I think it's about managing the expectation a little bit. But I'll let Marlin talk a bit more about potentially, you know, cluster feeding and, and that sort of thing is with regards to breastfeeding. I think, I think it's amazing that you, Kelly, actually have both experiences because I have a lot of patients that um, have heard from their friends that you really should be doing formula because it's much easier to get the baby into some sort of routine. Mm -hmm. You would sleep more, um, less colleague problems, et cetera, et cetera. All the, the benefits really of giving formula instead of, of breastfeeding. And these moms or these relatives or friends, they tend to only have been doing formula feeding. So they don't really have both experiences. And I think that's a bit unfair so if you really have both experiences and you're giving out advices that as well i actually have been formula feeding my first and the second ones i was fully completely breastfeeding it was actually easier to give formula then it's it's a complete different story but i would say i would like to add something in regards to the time time frame because we know that during the first four weeks there's a lot of things happening in the breast milk itself so after a month approximately, we know that the breast milk has kind of like found a balanced um, stage sort of saying. So before that, the breast milk is shaping itself after the baby. I like to say that. So there's a lot of things happening and this is causing a more sort of problem for the baby, tummy wise, uh, they make them a bit more uh, gassy, gathering wind, etc., etc. So for the first month, yes, I would say you tend to have a bit more feeding related problems for the baby if you're breastfeeding um, instead of giving formula. But after the first kind of crucial month, I would say there's really no difference in regard to routines, waking up times, because just as Louise is saying, we need to look at the basics, first of all. So for, for, for a baby that's only two weeks old, we don't really want them to sleep that long. They need to eat nice and steadily every three to four hours. And it doesn't matter if, you, if they've been feeding with formula, they cannot sleep for six to eight hours if they're form, formula feeded. So I would say, uh, uh, just to summarize up a little bit, yes, for sure, you might have a bit more um, fussy, uh, unorganized nights, especially if you're breastfeeding for the first month. But after that, really uh, looking at the benefits of breastfeeding compared to formula, uh, you always have the food with you. It's very, uh, you, you get a specific connection with the baby. Um, you don't have to look so much into buying any bottles or sterilization machines or anything like that. What sort of formula should I use? If the babies tend to have colic, is it related to the formula? And you know, all those things. So I would say if it's working, if you really want to breastfeed and you have a little bit of um, um, wavy start, again, take help and support from someone who has good breastfeeding experience because sometimes it's not, it doesn't take much. It's usually because of the baby's latch, meaning how the baby is taking, I mean, where, where am I? Taking the breast into the mouth. Usually with my patients, the only thing I do, not the only thing, but in most of the cases, I come home and I correct the baby's position. I might open up their mouth a little bit more or take a specific, uh, you know, we position the breast into the baby's mouth and that's it really. Yeah. So yes, it is com it, it's a complex thing, but with help and support, it can really be amazing. Yeah, I have to say having done both, I, I did prefer breastfeeding. Um, 
I thought that the formula would be quite easy because you, as you say, you know, you make up the bottles or, or you, you know, you've, you've got a, a routine and you know how much they're going to take at a certain time. But actually, sometimes baby would be crying and I think they were hungry. So I'd make up a formula bottle and then you'd be like, no, I don't want it. And they're kind of wasted. Whereas when you're breastfeeding, you just offer, offer it of your breast and then the baby takes it or doesn't take it. But you haven't sort of wasted all that time and effort going into making the bottle. So, yeah many other reasons but um so what in terms of things that you should 100 percent have in your home when a baby comes home um there's a lot of fancy things i know that are sort of nice to have luxuries but what would you say are the i don't know the crucial bits of equipment that you should have as a new mum all right yes um so the basics i would say I would say it's make a list for the baby and also make a list for the mom, actually. Perhaps also the father, but that's a bit more, you know, specialized, I would say. <laughs> so for the baby, I would say, first of all, diapers, newborn diapers, yeah. Secondly, uh, something to clean the baby's butt with. I pr prefer to use, um, what are they called nowadays? The, the wet wipes with only water in them. Water wipes. Water wipes. So water, water wipes are actually sponsoring this episode. So big oh. thanks to them. So that's wonderful that you uh, you mentioned them because we, as a, as a sponsor, we, we love the fact that they're very natural, that they're um, they're like cotton wool and water. Um, yeah. So good for any skin. Amazing because I actually I, I usually don't refer to any products. I do that very rarely. But I've been looking for these sort of wipes for a long, long, long time, even in the hospitals we were. Uh, so this is amazing because newborn skin is very fragile. And these super, super fragrance wipes. And when you open them up, it's kind of like going into a, to a perfume store. Obviously, this is not good for the baby skin. No wonder they have rashes and have a red, red butt. So yes, uh, wet wipes with um, not that much fragrances in them, preferably wet, wet wipes with water. Um, and then I would say some sort of nappy cream, like pseudo cream, for example. It should have zinc in it because it's very helpful to, to heal any sort of uh, diaper rashes. What else? Um, well, if we're, t if, you're, if, we're, if we're really talking about basics, I would say a baby crib a stroller um, you know, some baby clothes is good to have, but I'm talking, I'm a bit more focused on the pharmacy side, I think, yeah. because I, I can, I assume that expecting parents have already sorted the, the very basic things out when the baby arrives. So yeah, pseudo cream or any sort of cream that can heal the baby's butt. Um, I would say again, normal saline is amazing to have at home. Perhaps maybe also a um, file, a file, a nail file to, to just to, to shape down the baby's nails a little bit. You can cut them with a, with a scissor if you want to, but it's very easy to slip because they move around so much and you might cut in the little, little skin of their there. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to interrupt our conversation with Louise and Marlin very quickly to let you know that our fantastic sponsor, Water Wipes, is offering two lucky viewers the chance to win a month's supply of their ever so gentle water wipes. Being with a chance of winning, all you have to do is follow and like their Instagram page and their Facebook page. And also if you'd like to comment below telling us why you'd like to win the water wipes, and um, we will choose one of, oh, sorry, two of you lucky winners at random. Thank you so much and good luck. And thank you again to uh, water wipes for such a fantastic prize. Um, Louise, I know a lot of babies get quite snuffly as well when they're, they're newborn and parents can sort of panic that maybe they've got a cold or um, they're developing a, something else and they get a bit worried. What, any, any sort of tips, I guess, about when you should look to take a baby to a doctor? Because there is, you're very, you're very anxious in those first few months, aren't you, yeah. that your baby's getting ill? So. I mean, I suppose we know that in their first year of life, children to get more than 10 colds in, in the year. And they will get more if they've got siblings who are at nursery. 
And it, and it often tends to feel as a parent that you're just going from one infection to the next, that there's never a break. Um, and obviously, snuffly noses interrupts with breastfeeding, interrupts with sleep. And there are things that you can buy in a chemist's suckers. And um, I, I don't know whether either of you use the suckers where you, you're almost sucking the snot out of the nose. Now, infants have a natural ability to get rid of it by sneezing. And that's why infants sneeze, to clear their airways. But obviously, an infant's airways are very narrow. They're almost the diameter of a straw. So if something, if a bit of debris or snot is stuck, it's very noisy and quite worrying for parents. But I think in terms of when to seek support from a doctor, if, if your infant has a fever, um, if your infant develops a rash, if they're not feeding, obviously that becomes quite a concern, particularly with a young infant, they can quickly become dehydrated. So you need to get them checked out either by a family physician or the pediatrician. Uh, and I think certainly in the UAE, family physicians, GPs are very underutilized. Um, you know, we use them much more readily in Europe as a go-to for that first consultation before we decide by Dr. Google what the problem is. Um, so I think for new parents, you have a low threshold to go and seek support because often what parents will do is they will sit at home with this baby that they're a bit worried about and sit and worry and then it becomes huge. Um, so best to seek help. And certainly, you know, that's something that at Nightingale, we get calls um, from families who aren't quite sure, um, and Marlin and I will, will divert them appropriately. Either we, we can manage it or we divert them onto a doctor. Um, so, yeah, each case is different, but I think as parents, we have to appreciate that our infants will get coughs and colds in that first year pretty um, frequently. And what about things like baths? Because uh, that's also quite, I mean, I remember it being really exciting, but also terrifying, giving a baby their first bath. Um, what sort of products should you use? And should you invest in one of those stand-up baths? Or should you use a normal bath and just hold it with your hand? Or do you get a, like a lie-down plastic bath thing? Or do you do it in the sink? Do you use a sponge, a flannel? Well, I would say any way that suits you and your household, really. I mean, as long as the baby's getting clean. And I prefer to do soaked bath um, before sponge bath. In Dubai, I mean, in Sweden, we don't do anything like, I only came to know about sponge bathing when I moved to Dubai. So obviously I'm very keen on really soaking that baby into a nice warm 37 degrees hot water tub and uh, kind of making it to enjoyable time instead of doing, in, doing it as a night routine, even if the baby's crying, super, super red. So I would say, first of all, you don't have to give the baby a bath every day. Um, you, you actually might disturb the baby's flora on the skin if you do that very frequently. So I would say perhaps maybe once a week, twice a week. And if the baby's really, really enjoying it, you might want to do it every day, but with no products, only warm water. Um, so I would say for the first couple of weeks, yes, you can do it in, in the sink, in the kitchen if you want to, as long as the sink is clean and um, as long as the baby can really suit into that sink because they grow really fast. So you might want to invest in, that, in, in a type of uh, plastic bathing tub from Ikea or something like that, very, very easy. Um, if it feels scary in the beginning, which uh, I know that it can be, I sometimes say to the, to the daddy to go in, if you have a bathtub, like an adult one at home, you take a nice hot bath and then you just have the mom on the side and she can assist you. Give the baby to the daddy, have the baby kind of on your lap and there's no way you can drop the baby because you are, I mean, you are underneath the baby. Mm. So that could be something to do to start with. And then um, there are specific ways to hold the baby in, in the water, so you will not drop them for sure. Um, another thing aspect is to clean from top to bottom. So we don't start with the genitals or the feet. We start from top and then ending up with the genitals. Uh, and try to avoid and wet the baby's head 
to start with because then they might start to scream only because of the, the changes in the temperature. Uh, and in regards to products, I would say if you want to use oil, use it afterwards because otherwise the babies tend to get really slippery if you have oil in, in the actual water. Uh, clean with soap. Again, use a mild soap that doesn't smell, smell too, too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a good thing to have a pump rather than you know, a bottle. So it's easy if you hold the baby with one hand, you can just pump with the other one. Uh, and perhaps maybe the most important thing, turn off the AC and have everything ready because once you are there with the baby on your arm in the water, there's no way you can go and get the missing things like soap yeah. or the hand towel or things like that. And what about water temperature? Did you have one of those little water temperature Ah, if you want to, if you feel unsecure, otherwise you can just easily dip your uh, elbow or just a finger. It really should be 37 to 38 degrees. It shouldn't feel hot when you put, when you put your hand into the water. And if the, baby, if the baby's pooping, immediately take the baby out so they don't swallow the poop water. Uh, okay. um, and sticking with the water theme, obviously in the UAE you've got lovely warm climate so um a lot of parents are quite keen to know when they can get their babies into the water for the first time what is your advice on that louise is it after first injections is that kind of i would say idea? that's a, a good baseline really once you've had your first injections then i think it, it's pretty pretty safe um and but i think with that especially dependent on the time of year have to be so careful with the sunshine here. Um, make sure that babies are covered with rash vests and hats and they're factor 50. Um, I know that there's all sorts of higher factors than factor 50, but actually evidence tells us that factor 50 is okay, um, but we just have to reapply. Um, but yeah, making sure that whatever choice you make with water, whether you're at the beach or in the swimming pool, that it's shaded because particularly little babies can become dehydrated pretty quickly. So it's just about being sun aware. Yeah. And what, what age, remind me, remind us what age the first vaccinations are? So it's, oh gosh. Is it In the UK, months? it's three months, four months and five months. Uh, yeah, it's the same year, yeah. Sorry, yeah, of course there's different schedules, aren't there? So I know yeah. some people follow the UK schedule while they're here and some people follow the UAE schedule. So about three months. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and it's a nice thing to get your child into pretty early on, particularly if we li as we live here, um, lots of opportunity. But yes, safety, there's, and I think, you know, you just have to, even if your, your child, your older child is in very shallow water, it's making sure that they are always, always supervised near water in of, of any depth. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add but that I and mean, I literally could talk about this for hours and hours. I think there's so much um, so much information that you ladies could could give and really help um, these new mums who are watching. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add that you think I've maybe missed or that you think is really important. I think the one thing I would add is that um, Becoming a mother is a little bit like applying for a job that you have no experience of doing. And, you know, it comes very naturally to some mums and they really take to it and they in the swing of it from the beginning. And for others, it's not that easy. And those first few weeks are really tricky. And I think it's important to say that those first six weeks particularly, um, that it's normal to feel tearful overwhelmed but that from six weeks onwards that should begin to feel better and almost mums often describe that the fog seems to lift a little bit at that six week mark and that that would be normal so postnatal depression is very common and particularly when you're isolated from your family and especially now during this situation with COVID-19 we have lots of new mummies who are potentially quite isolated. So I suppose from my perspective, the most important thing is that there is help out there if you feel that you're now past six weeks and, and things are really difficult. And the two questions that we ask about most are, do you feel hopeless and do you feel helpless? 
And if as a mum you're sort of 12 weeks post delivery and you're still tearful and you feel both of those things, then you really need to get some help. And that, that can either be from people like Marlon and myself, from family physicians, or if you're feeling very, very um, unwell from a mental health perspective, then from, from um, you know, psychotherapists or psychiatric help. But it's really just to put it out there that some degree of postnatal depression is normal and not that unusual. Baby blues is completely normal. Um, but when that begins to get worse or not get better, then you need to seek help. Yeah, that's very important. Thank you. Can I just say amazing words from an amazing person? Hmm. I really, I, I, I don't think I have anything else to add other than maybe a little bit labor and delivery related because I mean, not all labors goes as planned and um, as especially today because I actually became an auntie today Ooh, and thank you. thank you so much <laughs> and I just wanted to say that if if you ever if you're a mom listening to this and if you had a traumatic experience from your labor please make sure that you talk to someone about this and uh, again like Louise said there is help and support to get even if you might think that my my issue is so special and so specific so i don't think i can get any help with this but try investigate because you might be surprised what all the healthcare professionals in dubai are able to do nowadays so i think that's my my last advice and of course enjoy enjoy the journey because they grow so quickly yeah, that oh, they sure. do <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's amazing. Um, it, it's really, I think it's really important to emphasize that here there, there are ladies like yourselves who are there to help and you're just a phone call away. Um, and I think that, you know, you mums need to use you guys as much as possible um, and that will help. And I know that there's lots of well-meaning advice from friends, but um, <laughs> everyone's experience is different and you have to sort of know that what you're doing is right for your child. So thank you. I really appreciate your time. And um, yeah, thanks for all the amazing advice. Thank, thank you. you for us. Thank you. Thanks so much to Louise and Marlin for that very informative talk. And hopefully if you're about to bring your new baby home for the first time, you're feeling a little bit more reassured that it's all going to be okay. And I'd like to thank Water Wipes again for sponsoring this episode. 